We are good to go. Alright, uh, I am here with Kalen Robertson. Do not mess that up. He is always sure to uh, make it known that it's pronounced Kalen. Uh, he's an ex-Rebel media uh, contributor, and now he's starting his own venture, which is the Culture Report. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, Kalen? Yeah, the Culture Report is basically there to fill the gap in the UK, well, the European market for media that's actually authentic, for media that's actually ethical from the ground, which gives people and contributors a chance to actually speak their opinion without being shouted down instantly. Um, I mean, it's basically the alternative to Channel 4 and also to the fake news on the right as well. There's a lot of right-wing news websites in Europe that have been taking precedence and taking um, taking over the market, and they, they're full of sort of fake news as well, and sort of overblown headlines and overblown articles and missing information. And I think that what's happening in Europe is already shocking enough. There's no need for clickbait or for exaggerations or for anything like that. If you just report it on what's going on on this continent, that is enough, I think. Um, so it's basically there to be sort of in the center, but we wear our bias on the sleeve as an alternative media platform, and people seem to be really liking it. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, I don't hear that criticism enough uh, from the right, where it's, you know, we, we have a bunch of really biased outlets too, and uh, I, I love that you're doing that, because I think we're going to need this going forward, because it's hard to tell what's going on at any given time, because the far left has, has their own thing, and the far right has their own thing, and you, you put them together, and it's like still not a complete story anyway. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree. That's the great thing about this is that every interview we do gets fully uploaded in its unedited entirety at the end. You know, there's no clicks, there's no jump cuts, anything like that. Every, when we go out in Europe reporting from Sweden and across the continent, all the footage is going to be, you know, unedited live stream. So that's, that's, I think that's something that is missing all over the uh, media spectrum. So what are, what are you seeing in Europe right now? Is it as crazy as, as the far right is saying it is, or is it as benign as the far left is saying it is? Like, what, what exactly is the climate right now? I think when it comes to Europe, the way the far left talk about it is actually completely accurate. It's, it's, I haven't really seen any overblown reports on what's been going on when I was in the media talking about Sweden. The facts and statistics released by the government or the, or, or, or the police tie in to what, to what we're saying. Rates going through the roof. Europe is completely collapsing, except for Eastern Europe, obviously. R Romania and uh, Poland and these countries seem to be striving forward and protecting their identity. But the UK isn't so far gone. And I, we're, we're going on a European trip next month and we'll be covering all these things, going to all these towns, speaking to all these people, and we'll show you exactly what's going on there. But in the UK specifically, the thing I'm seeing hit hardest is free speech. That's been completely impressed and eroded. 97% of UK universities last year censored free speech in some form. 97% is insane. They're meant to be the hub of free speech. I'm sure you know all about that. The um, There are uh, sort of truck stops where trucks go to fill up for petrol at motor stations. We're going to be reporting on that soon. Where you can see migrants jumping out the back of them, in which they've jumped on in Calais, running into the bushes, running into the jungle. Once they're in the country, they can't be deported. And there are entire enclaves, which are basically no-go zones, which reporters like myself, even on the left or the right, just cannot go into. Oh, I went with Tommy Robinson in one of those areas, and I don't know if you've seen the video, where cars were pelted with rocks and bricks, and were chased down the motorway. Yeah. It to the police, it took them three hours to turn up, and when they did, they kind of went, oh, so you went down that area. Oh, okay, well, fair enough. As if this is you know, a normal day-to-day -day thing. If, you, if there are no-go zones, that's a symptom of a radicalized society, and that's what we're seeing in these huge, growing enclaves of British society. It's really, really, really worrying. And I think what you see happening in London is a huge growth of these of these societies in inner cities growing out. And that is probably a catalyst to the rest of the UK, to the rest of Europe, where everything is headed. It's really, really worrying. Very pessimistic about it. Yeah, well, there was just um, an attack yesterday in London, wasn't there? Um, 11 people were injured or something by a, an explosion. Uh, yeah. So we... Yeah, sorry, go on. You know, we see these things uh, pretty regularly now. Uh, I mean, in the news, in any given week, you can probably find an Islamic attack. Um, but the Unite the Right rally, there was, you know, uh, of course, the tragedy of one person being killed. But after that, everybody was saying, you know, fascists, white supremacists, they need to have their rights taken away. But they wouldn't do the same thing for, uh, for Islam because... 
uh, even though they're deadlier, it's it's supposed to be the religion of peace. So what, what do you make of something like that? Um, I think not even when it comes to the censoring of Islam on the other side, any even far left rallies that take place. If someone died at a far left rally because a uh, someone drove a car into them from the left or they drove into the car to the right wing protesters, we would never be having this conversation. When Tommy Robinson had an event UK against hate in Manchester a few months ago, thousands of people turned up. The mayor the next day decided to open a dialogue and say we should really consider banning all far right protests because there was uh, some violence by the left. And that is the immediate response you get to things like Charlottesville. And it's really, really, really worrying because it's infringing on basic human rights. It will never happen with Islamic protests, no matter how extreme the dialogue is. It will never happen with extreme far left communist, Stalinist protests, no matter how extreme that is. Uh, but our politicians, mayors, everyone are foaming at the mouth to try and shut down that dialogue. So the second they get an opportunity, They'll manipulate it, and of course they'll try and shut, shut the march down. Yes, someone was killed at a Charlottesville rally, and you can call that far-right extremism and authenticate the left slightly. But if you compare it to the number of deaths caused by an Islamic ideology, it is in the hundreds of thousands over the last you know, few hundred years, and even about 30,000 since 9-11. 30,000 compared to, what, 10 in the last 10 years from this yeah. far-right extremism is incomparable. Uh, but the reaction is completely different. It's, uh, it's to be expected, but it's absolutely terrifying for that kind of thing to be happening in the West. Yeah, so um, a lot of people, or a lot of your detractors, will call you an Islamophobe, but, uh, I mean, is it really being phobic of something if that many people are dying? Of course not. It's, a ration, it's just being rational. Islamophobia is the most rational thing you can possibly be. I think it's completely justified. There's nothing scary about fearing... Uh, Islamists and fearing the ideology of Islam. If you look at 1945, many people were fearful of the Nazi ideology, which can be very easily compared to the Islamic ideology. And people weren't called Nazi folks, I don't think they were, and it would be completely ridiculous. But we're at war with them like we were with the Nazis, they're at war with us like the Nazis were. However, they have managed to victimize themselves to the point where even the worst part of their ideology cannot be criticized. The term Islamophobia is the most pathetic thing I've ever heard. And when people shout to me that I'm an Islamophobe from the left, I say, well, yeah, of course, I'm a rational human being. It's a compliment, actually. <laughs> I like that. Um, so I was mentioning earlier uh, the, the blog that was just <laughs> screaming at you, basically. Uh, and I remember uh, a couple months ago, Antifa was at your doorstep. Um, ha have you been getting more vitriolic... Uh, I guess encounters and and hate spewed at you, or or what? How how has it been for you lately? Things have died down quite a lot because I haven't been as active with Tommy on the ground. We have it's usually Antifa turns up when we're doing you know huge reports where we're going out every day covering left wing activists. We basically trolled thousands of people over the space of a short period of time going up to left wing protests and just mocking them. Yeah, and they responded by turning up to the house, of course. We've moved address since then, partially because of that, partially because the address is just on the internet. So they actually don't know where we are now, so it's less likely to happen. But when we start reporting again, going to these protests, going to Europe, we expect the same thing. In terms of like security and my life changing, I don't really notice much of a difference because I don't really see them as a major threat. Antifa and far left activists will turn up at your house, they'll intimidate you, they might punch you, but they're not going to shoot you. I mean, they they. You know, they might lose their place at the, whatever art college they go to if they actually commit a, a major crime. So that's not going to happen. Um, so I don't really care. I mean, if you look at angry tweets towards me or anything like that, I mean, it's just, it's just boring. I don't really care. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that. Um, you know, you're, you're unapologetic in the way that you, you mock uh, agitators. And I think that's something that needs to be popular among the right because uh, with Amer the American right, at, at the very least, uh, we're always on the back foot, always apologizing, uh, always trying to get our democratic overlords to, like, you know, um, give us a little bit of, of leeway. I mean, with the GOP in, in Congress, I mean, they had the majority of the House, the Senate, and they had the president, and still, we're, we're, we're not seeing as much progress as we were hoping for, or really, many of uh, Trump's uh, promises are, are just falling through right now. So... How do you see that uh, changing or that dynamic in the UK? Uh, the UK is a lot worse than the US. We don't have any Trump-style figures 
anywhere uh, in, in any form of politics. It looked like they're going to get anywhere near uh, number 10 Downing Street. So it's a complete disaster with that. If you think the swamp is bad in America, this is like a, the entire country is the swamp. So it's a lot worse here. I mean, the mayor, I think most of the mayors of all of our major cities are actually Muslim now. In Birmingham, our second largest city, and London, our number one biggest city. And they are imposing incredibly totalitarian and depressing regimes across across the cities and they have incredible power within parliament if any of our prime ministers or mps even suggested policies slightly close to trump they would be laughed out of parliament no one would support them so this is the uk is not really changing in terms of politics right now apparently we have a conservative government there's nothing conservative about them our current prime minister banned pamela geller richard spencer robert spencer from the uk permanently for hate speech what on earth kind of left-wing government would do that yeah i mean it's 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 a lot worse than the us yeah so is is i mean is there any hope for the conservative base to to actually have policy that they want, or is this just a downward slope from here? Even if there was a base for the conservatives to have the policy that they want, I wouldn't want them to have it because the conservatives in this country aren't even real conservatives anymore. As I said, their policies bound people like Pamela Geller. They are the ones who allow well, mass immigration to the UK. That's the thing that they wanted. You know, those are their policies. So I don't even think we have any true, real right wing conservatives actively in the UK. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's a shame. I don't really care what the Conservative Party do because it doesn't really differ from the Labour Party. Yeah, and something that um, recently came into my attention was that uh, this has been going on for a long time. I mean, uh, Reagan, who's looked like, like a god to most neocons, uh, he provided amnesty for like 4 million illegal aliens uh, back in the 80s. And so... Um, I'm not really sure when when the Republican Party even did this about face. Uh, is there any signifier to you with with uh, the UK where where this has happened? Uh, what do you mean with amnesty with immigrants? Of uh, I guess implementing otherwise socialist or democrat um, or left wing policies. Oh, I mean, I, on the top of my head, I couldn't think too thoroughly of one. But I mean, I know that a second illegal immigrant arrives in the UK, they immediately have the right to stay unless they commit a major crime, which usually will be staying anyway. So that's a completely ridiculous policy. Um, on the top of my head, I can't really think of any. I, I mean, it's it's not so bad in terms of socialist policies. It's just completely ill thought out um, relaxed border policies, which, which we've been concerned with and which have been taking place. Uh, otherwise than that, there, there aren't really, there isn't really much like that going on. Well, you mentioned the uh, the policy of once an immigrant gets into the country, they they can stay unless they do something really bad. Uh, can, you, can you go into depth about that? I, I was not aware of this at all. Yeah, I mean, there are some detention centers in the UK but it's extremely difficult for them to actually take in any inmates. These are detention centers, by the way, places where they go before they get deported back to their own country. It's extremely difficult to go through that process because our laws are sent, you know, sent straight out and outsourced to the European Court of Human Rights. Everything goes through them and it overrides any of our policies and rules. So if an immigrant arrives in the UK, first of all, they'll have thrown away their passport so their country of origin will be virtually impossible to find out. So the question is, even if you want to deport them, where can they go? You can't just send them to somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in Africa. And even if you find a country of origin, it's very unlikely that the um, that the governor of that of that country will even allow the plane to land and even take them because they'll say, well, we don't want a criminal, we don't want someone in the country. So there's a major, major problem with where do they go? Where can we put them back to? Once they're in the UK, you can't send them back to France, France won't take them. So they're kind of your problem now. And the second thing is just their basic human rights, which have been given to them by the EU, means that it would infringe on their human rights to forcibly remove them from the UK. Um, that's, the, that's the basic thing that overrides everything. Unless they commit a really serious crime and they've done their jail sentence, then they can, they can build, they'll, they'll want to deport them, but then they still have to go through the Court of European Human Rights. And barely any, it's like 10 or something or 20 a year actually go through that process. So basically, once you arrive in the UK, illegally, you're going to be granted access for the rest of your life and your family from abroad to come in. And that's, that's the reality. Wow, I'm actually taken aback by that. Um, 
Oh, holy crap. Uh, so... So when, when uh, they talk about Brexit, um, and, and it seems like they're really trying to stall this one out, um, is there hope to, to reclaim that sovereignty, or, or what kind of deal are we looking at for, for the EU-British uh, uh, shift? I haven't been looking too much into the Brexit policies because I don't really think Brexit's going to make much of a difference with the UK. Obviously, I voted for Brexit. It's great to troll the leftists and the, and the <laughs> great fun, but who cares past that point because the country's already finished, I think. I mean, if we leave the EU, uh, we will probably still have massive open borders like we did before we joined. We might allow slightly less Europeans in, but the immigrants who are already here or already have massively higher birth rates than indigenous Brits and are already taking over huge proportions of the, of the of the country on the ground level, education level, everywhere. So the Brexit didn't really do anything. It's going to slow down the inevitable of immigrant minorities becoming the majority by maybe 10, 20 years, but that's as far as it goes. So the individual policies don't really make a difference. I think the UK is already finished in that term, and Brexit was just kind of a last gasp of patriotism. Um, from the Brits. So, when we look at somewhere like Poland, um, what what exactly are they doing differently that's that's uh, helping them maintain their social cohesion and their culture? Well, if you first of all look at the way that uh, Poland is socially. When Trump arrived in Europe, he went to France, he went all over to every single country. The only country he had a positive reaction in was Poland. He was cheered, he was applauded, it was amazing. That's because they like his policies of nationalism, of national pride, of patriotism. And that's the difference between Poland and the rest of the of the European Union, the rest of the EU, is that they actually care about their country and most fundamentally, they actually have borders that they reinforce. Only a couple of weeks ago, the uh, head of the EU said that Poland must open their borders, they must take in more refugees, they must take their fair share. And the uh, Prime Minister, uh, he compared it to being raped as a country and being threatened because of how ridiculous it would be. They accept no no immigrants, uh, no migrants, they don't want Islam in their country. That's why they haven't experienced any terrorism, not one terrorist attack because they don't have Islam. They don't let in loads of refugees and, mi and migrants. I think Poland will be the last country to fall in the EU, specifically because of the way they are. Yeah, and um, do you think it has anything to do with the, the history of Poland? I mean, every time there's a big war or something, it seems like they always get the raw end of the stick or, or they're the last to, to resist. Yeah, it's very true. Poland, people from Poland have always been very, very patriotic towards their country. They were always very active in those wars and protecting their country and protecting their borders. And they passed that idea down through the generations and it's just carried on. And it's still a very, very patriotic country. And so I think that's a very, very key part in, in, in the success of its and its future. So uh, what what is the, the future for, um, I guess, nationalists in the EU or yeah, I guess in countries in the EU, the UK, and um, in the US, uh, are we all just going to have to get uh, Polish passports, or, or what are we doing? I was thinking about this recently. So I would, you know, looking at birth rates in the UK, looking at birth rates in Europe, it's only a matter of 30 or 40 years before um, African and Middle Eastern immigrants become the 51% voting majority, voting in Sharia governments, blah, 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 which means there'll be a huge expected exodus of indigenous Europeans fleeing to probably Australia, Poland, or America. Canada, gone. Uh, yeah. Most of these other countries are completely finished. I think, I think your country is watching very, very closely what's happening in Europe. I think that's why Trump was voted, because they can see how badly these policies are. And I think because of that, and because of the fact that you guys are so patriotic, you voted in Trump, you will actually survive this, this chaos. So I think, yeah, you'll have a massive exodus of Europeans going to Australia, which care about the borders, and they're so far away from Muslim countries, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and America, who has strong borders. There won't be anything left of Europe except for a Sharia-compliant totalitarian state. Guaranteed. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, just by birth rates alone. Unless you can only reverse this through mass deportation, which just isn't going to happen. I mean, it would never happen, so. Yeah. Uh, so when, when you say the... Uh the majority will become the minority pretty soon. Uh, a lot of the left, the argument I always hear is, well, why does that matter? And, I mean, it flabbergasts me, but can can you put it into words why why that would actually have a, a really bad uh, impact for, for the natives? 
Yeah, I mean, whatever immigrant you're taking in, whether it's from North Africa or the Middle East, they will always vote in their interests for their communities. They do not immigrate. Channel 4 carried out a study a few years ago looking at the attitudes of Muslims in the UK, and the majority supported Sharia law, the death of homosexuals, the way that women should be treated really poorly. Those attitudes aren't being diluted while they go into a progressive, great society. They're staying with the communities, and actually the younger ones are becoming more radicalized than their parents. And they will vote, this is why it's important, they will vote for local and national governments to support those ideologies and those interests, which means that eventually, when they do become the 51, 52% majority, they will, of course, vote in a new UK Sharia party that supports their attitudes and views, that despises the West. That will be disastrous for any indigenous Brits, for any women, for any gays, anyone like that. And uh, that's why they should be worried. Of all the people who are worried about this crisis, the left should be most worried, but they are the least. Yeah, it seems like they just actively encourage it. And um, so I remember there was the anti-Sharia rally in California uh, a couple months ago, and everybody you know, mocked them uh, on the left. They were saying, oh, well, this is never going to happen. Where's the Sharia? Uh, yeah, and you're smirking now. I, um, yeah, why why is that not ridiculous to say we need to re- resist Sharia now? Uh, my only answer to that is to look at Lebanon. Look at what Bridget Gabriel even said about Lebanon. Lebanon was a Christian country, and then it got, when, when Sharia started creeping in and started to take hold because of rising populations in, in Muslim um, communities, there was a genocide towards the Christians in that country. They were completely massacred. Sharia was brought in. The whole country fell apart. You only have to look at examples where this has happened in the rest of the world. Of course, Sharia isn't going to take over America tomorrow. However, if America keeps its borders open and keeps implementing people who have a birth rate over six, where Americans have a birth rate of like 2.5, then they are going to have Sharia law in 100 years or 80 years. I'd have to do the math. And that's just how it works in a democratic society. The people who want Sharia, who take over the indigenous, will vote for Sharia policies. So that's why they should be worried. And there is, it's, it's indisputable. It's happened in the past. It's its going to happen again. So just show them Lebanon. Take them to Lebanon <laughs> on a plane, one way. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's its like um, pointing to the USSR for communists. They go, well, uh, that's not real communism. I'm, I'm wondering how they'll they'll think their way out of uh, the Lebanon example. They, they'll go, well, that's not real Sharia or something, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. It's exactly what they'll do. It's extremely depressing listening to their arguments, but they do believe it. They're not They're not uh, just trying to be spiteful. It's what they've been told in college. It's what they've been told on BuzzFeed, and it's what they think is counterculture and cool to believe. Uh, but it's not going to be very cool when they're being killed in their own country. So let's see, let's see where that takes them. Yeah, and um, I don't want to leave on too dark of a note because uh, I mean Sharia and massacres are <laughs> not exactly too too happy. But um, how 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 best can we can we mock and troll the left to ch- try and show people that are kind of on the fence that they're really ridiculous and they are uh, laughable most of the time. Well, the next time someone says that's not real communism, say well when they talk about the Nazi party, say, well, that wasn't real Nazism. They just didn't implement it quite right. It wasn't a real thing. Reverse their arguments all the time, flip it on their head, and give it back to them. Whenever they talk about how much they hate white people and, oh, white people ruin everything, just reply saying, well, black people ruin everything, and then have the same (laughs) contract. That drives them completely mad and and, and insane. The second is to go to their protests, to go to where they hang out, to go to their uh, centers, their daycare centers, whatever they do, and to put a microphone in their face and to ask them real questions and hard-hitting questions and just humiliate them on the internet because those people seem to think they're winning in real life but on the internet they are being massacred they're completely losing uh, they're ridiculed social justice warriors are known as the most hilarious thing ever across the board the mainstream media family guy even take the piss out of them now so that is the best way to win with the left we already have the arguments we already have the humor so put them together and Put them in, put them in front of them. <laughs> All right, yeah. Well, thank you for that advice, uh, Kalen Robertson, uh, the Culture Report. Um, thank you so much for joining me uh, and the College Republicans at the University of Texas at El Paso. Thank you. Uh, you know, we're very grateful that you you took the time out of your day to join us. Thanks again. It was great talking. Yeah. Um,
and I'm just going to end the recording there. All right, so we're going to probably have this edited.